Maris Torda is professor at Oxford U Brookes University and the director of its Center for Medical Humanities. His main research interests include history of eugenics, scientific racism, history of anthropology, and the history of medicine. He has published a number of books on the history of eugenics, including Modernism and Eugenics, Latin Eugenics in Comparative Perspective, and the history of East Central European eugenics, texts and commentaries. He also produced a podcast series on the current relevance of eugenics and is the curator of two exhibitions on the history of eugenics. My name is Marius Turda. I am a professor of history at Oxford Brookes University, where I teach courses on the history of eugenics and racism. I'm also the curator of a new exhibition on the history and contemporary relevance of eugenics entitled, We Are Not Alone, Legacies of Eugenics, which is on display at the Wiener Holocaust Library between the 21st and the 30th of September, 2021, marking a century since the influential Second International Eugenics Congress was organized at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. This centenary presents us with a critical moment to review how myriad assumptions and attitudes rooted in eugenics continue to affect our world in ways both obvious and hidden, engaging with and contributing to a global anti-eugenic movement of reckoning with the past. The exhibition, We Are Not Alone, The Legacies of Eugenics, reveals the shifting and fluid meanings which characterize ideas of human betterment in different national and international contexts. In a much circulated poster, Nazi propagandists claimed that their program of compulsory sterilization was in no way different from other similar legislation introduced in countries such as the United States of America and Sweden and planned in Japan and in other European countries such as Britain, Hungary, and Poland. We're not the only ones planning to eliminate defectives from society, they said. This message was conveyed by way of an image of a man protecting his wife and child by holding a shield with the inscription, the law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring, 14th of July, 1933. This is a powerful image, and it is particularly powerful because it simplifies a very complex story and presents us with an uncomfortable truth. The good guys were equally bad. There is no such thing as bad eugenics and good eugenics. It is this claim that I explore in the exhibition, aiming to reveal the transnational character of eugenics across the 20th century and beyond. In the following, I would like to briefly describe the main components of the exhibition. It consists of 10 sections and several artifacts from the science collection and the Galton Archive at University College London. We begin by looking at British eugenics and the first International Congress of Eugenics convened in London in 1912. The British scientist Francis Galton coined the term eugenics in 1883 from the Greek expression, well born. He defined it as the study of agencies under social control that may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. At the end of the 19th century, many people from across the political spectrum and from various scientific positions were attracted by the prospect of improving the human race through eugenics. Eugenics was also seen as a solution to social problems as diverse as crime, alcoholism, and poverty. By the time the first International Congress of Eugenics convened in London in 1912, eugenic societies had been established in Germany, Britain, Sweden, and the United States of America. It had become a truly global phenomenon. We then look at marriage, family, and children to 
uh, important topics discussed by eugenicists worldwide. Eugenicists were avid communicators. Across the world, they sought to engage with the public through lectures, fairs, writings, plays, art and design, radio talks, films, and of course, exhibitions. They were keenly aware that complex scientific ideas about human heredity and its role in shaping our lives could be most easily disseminated when visualized at public fairs, for instance, or in the press. Popular culture was the most efficient way to bridge the gap between specialized knowledge about eugenics and the interests of the public around a number of issues from marriage and family to the well-being of future generations. In the next section, we'll look at education. Education was of paramount importance to eugenics. From its inception, the Eugenics Education Society in Britain aspired to further eugenic teaching at home, in the school and elsewhere. In turn, eugenics appealed to educationalists, school reformers and feminists who advocated teaching children and the youth of the nation sound morals alongside physical education and modern ideas of hygiene. They were considered essential to maintaining a healthy body and mind and in society's advancement towards a eugenic future. The general unpreparedness of teachers in matters of eugenic education was, however, one major obstacle. Hence, the involvement of the eugenic society in the training of teachers, social and care workers, in the basic knowledge of heredity and eugenics, so they could identify the intellectual and physical needs of those under their supervision and act accordingly. In the fourth section, we look at feeble-mindedness and mental deficiency. Eugenics asserted the supremacy of heredity. Notions of cultural progress, intellectual achievement, racial protectionism, biological decline, social pathology, and criminal behavior were all infused with the belief that it was the quality of a person's heredity that determined their destiny. To correct the outcome of successive generation of unfortunate mating choices through education and environmental improvement was deemed too costly and rather ineffectual. Instead, the solutions preferred by the eugenicists, such as sterilization, segregation, legislation against immigration and miscegenation, were seen as more practical and imagined to have an immediate effect on society. The term feeble-minded was first used in 1876. The Royal College of Physicians in London defined a feeble-minded person to be one who is capable of earning his living under favorable circumstance, but is incapable from mental defect existing from birth or from an early age of A, competing on equal terms with his normal fellows, or B, of managing himself and his affairs with, with ordinary prudence. Feeble-mindedness and its corollary, mental deficiency, was one of the major issues that brought together and also divided scientists, politicians, health reformers, and educators. Eugenicists were constantly alarmed by the growing number of people they call feeble-minded. In their scientific publications, political speeches, newspaper articles, and public lectures, they constantly used terms that we recognize today as exceptionally offensive. Feeble-mindedness was believed to be hereditary and a threat to the future of the race. We then look at American eugenics and the Second International Congress of Eugenics organized in New York in 1921. The organized eugenic movement in the United States sprang from many theoretical sources this, including, this included anarchism, modern approaches to hygiene and health, political efforts to restrict immigration and prevent miscegenation, 
and of course, Mendelian genetics. The American Breeders Association was the first national organization to promote eugenic and genetic research. Its Committee on Eugenics was established in 1906 and led by the botanist Luther Burbank. In the same year, nutritionist John Kellogg founded the Race Betterman Foundation, Foundation in Battle Creek, Michigan. The Eugenics Record Office at Cold Spring Harbor, New York, was, however, the leading organization, attracting some of the nation's major scientists. The world's, the world's first realization law was enacted, enacted in 1907 in Indiana, establishing a tradition of punitive and negative eugenic practices whose outcomes are felt to this day. Two international congresses in eugenics were organized at the National History Museum in New York in 1921 and 1932, respectively, confirming United States leadership in global eugenics. From America, we cross back into Europe and we look at German and Nazi racial hygiene. Eugenic ideas of race improvement travel fast and wide across Germany during the 1880s. Physician Wilhelm Schallmeier was amongst the first to formulate a theory of eugenics based on the idea of Ferrerbums Hygiene, hereditary hygiene. Another complementary concept, Tenrasen Hygiene, racial hygiene, was formulated by physician Alfred Plötz. The latter term expressed both the scope and the intentions of German eugenics, which became fixated on the protection of the hereditary qualities of the race. There was, however, a diversity of opinion on every eugenic issue of importance. For instance, some German eugenicists endorsed ideas of Aryan supremacy, Nordicism, and anti-Semitism, while others were critical of them. Many feminists and eugenicists on the left endorsed eugenics realization, but Catholic conservatives often opposed it. Aided by several political factors, including the defeat in World War I and the rise of Nazism, racial hygiene movement in Germany became the world's most successful. Its consequences were devastating, however. After 1933, it has mixed deeply with racism and anti Semitism, leading to the murder of thousands of people with disability through the T4 euthanasia program, and then to the extermination of millions of people in the Holocaust. We then look at how broadly, geographically, and conceptually eugenic, eugenics became during the interwar period. We look at its internationalization. Between the 1880s and the 1950s, Eugenic movements developed across Europe, North, Central, and South America, as well as India, Japan, China, and Australasia. National eugenic societies had been established before World War I. During the interwar period, they thrived, and some, such as the Greek Eugenic Society, for instance, only developed during the early 1950s. Some of these societies collaborated within the International Federation of Eugenic Organizations, while others acted regionally, such as those organizing the Pan American Office of Eugenics and Homiculture. Others still decided to establish an alternative International Federation of Latin Eugenic Societies. The nationalization of eugenics and its internationalization went hand in hand both in practice and in rhetoric. Each national context had its own model of eugenics, but eugenicists learn how to communicate efficiently across borders, to exchange views and inspire one another. With this idea in mind, we move to the next panel, which look at the scientists, which looked at the experts. For almost a century, eugenics influenced and transformed social, re social realities and the scientific explanations that accompanied them. 
It also weaponized politics and radicalized culture, promoting discrimination and inequality. As it dehumanized the human subject, eugenics skillfully maneuvered its way into a position of power and authority by associating itself with a host of concerns, from human rights, reproductive or otherwise, to environmentalism and ecology. Importantly, eugenics was constantly sustained by expert knowledge and bolstered by scientific research that poured out of institutes, universities, private and state organizations, and various government agencies. In turn, eugenicists were considered experts and they advised and knowledge widely praised as beneficial to society. We then turn to those targeted by eugenic policies. We turn to the victims. Eugenicists targeted people in society who were considered to be substandard, either due to their physical or mental disabilities, or because their social and racial non-white origins positioned them in less privileged society less privileged position in society. In his 1951 Cavendish lecture to the West London Medical Chirurgical Society, Ernst Barnes, Bishop of Birmingham, described these people as inferior human strains. Discriminatory eugenic arguments were used against these individuals, targeting them irrespective of age and gender. Children, were murdered in Nazi Germany, and Black and Hispanic women were sterilized in North America. Indigenous people across the world were subjected to humiliating racial research to assume their, to evidence their assumed inferiority, a practice also extended to ethnic minorities such as the Roma in Europe. Racial, social, and cultural boundaries between eugenically valuable individuals and those considered otherwise have been repeatedly reinforced through racist legislation, medical institutionalization, and state-sanctioned policies of segregation and annihilation. In the last panel of the exhibition, we turn to the ways we can employ to fight back. We turn to confronting eugenics. Healing the deep wounds caused by a century of eugenics requires public recognition of those wronged in the past and of those who continue to be mistreated in the present. It is a slow process, but progress is being made. Victims of sterilization in Japan, the Czech Republic, Peru, the United States and elsewhere are finally being issued official apologies and provided with financial compensation. Human reproductive rights everywhere must be respected and no eugenic discrimination against people belonging to religious, ethnic and sexual minorities or of those living with disabilities should be allowed to happen again. Historically disenfranchised groups such as the Roma must be empowered and racism rejected unhesitatingly. The stories of those women and men who've been harmed by eugenics must be told and their lives respected. As Kita Saburo, a Japanese victim of civilization, so poignantly put it, I just want the authorities to apologize for the injustice. If we act alone, they can break us like disposable chopsticks. But if you unite, we will become a large tree. No one can break us. A tree speaks of hope togetherness. It speaks of dedication and collective and personal healing. It also allows us to turn to one of the most familiar images associated with eugenics, that of a large tree with strong roots, each representing a scientific discipline. This includes biology, anthropology, genetics, medicine, psychiatry, sociology, education, and politics. The accompanying note is clear. Like a tree, eugenics draws 
its materials from many sources and organizes them into an harmonious entity. As the official logo of two international congresses on eugenics, held in 1921 and 1932, this tree captured the attention of scientists and participants attending these major events, that it was represented as a synthesis of all scientific, social, religious, cultural and political activities is only one of the signs explaining the longevity of eugenics. The other is the credibility of the Western scientific tradition into which eugenics was planted by Francis Galton during the 1860s and 1870s. Nurtured by scientists devoted to race improvement, the tree of eugenics grew stronger and stronger, reaching maturity during the 1930s. After the Holocaust, the tree was denuded of its branches, but its roots remained buried deep, embedded in our society, culture, and politics. They continue to provide sustenance to various social, economic, and educational policies across the world. The time has come to cut down this tree and remove its global roots. We must plant another tree, one, that reflects our collective reckoning with the legacies of eugenics. Judy Dow, an Abenaki French-Canadian educator and artist, created a witness tree to capture this anti-eugenic movement, which we included in the exhibition. Her message, and the one which I want to share with our visitors, is this. Like a tree, anti-eugenics draws from many sources and transforms them into a one mind and one heart way of being. Such, in confusing brevity, are the main lines of the historically informed account of our eugenic past, present and future, which this exhibition seeks to describe, balancing various elements of continuity and discontinuity of idiosyncrasy and similarity. Continuing education about and engagement with eugenics, as well as its public condemnation, are essential components of our efforts to understand a hidden and unpleasant past, while at the same time continuing work towards a fair and just society. A century later, since the Second International Eugenics Congress, we invite visitors to engage with the legacies of eugenics across time and space and to reflect on what eugenics means for us today. This remains a very sensitive and emotional issue for many people, not least because for so long, eugenics has reinforced discriminatory practices based on race, class, gender, disability and age. A global reckoning with the legacies of eugenics is essential for a broader social, gender, and racial justice project to succeed. Thank you.